You know, we've been talking about whether or not the art is contained in the object mm -hmm. or the art is contained in the things that surround it. Yeah. And what's really interesting is that in the late 20th century, artists started to make art that was explicitly about the way that society frames a work of art. And one of the great examples of that is by Hans Hacke from 1975, a work of art which takes a small painting by the famous neo-impressionist painter George Seurat. Everybody knows his painting, The Isle of the Grand Jat. But what Hacke did is he centered his work of art on a small sketch by Seurat. And this work of art had gone from the artist's studio through many, many hands until it ended up partially owned by an investment firm and actually put in a bank vault. And so he frames a series of pieces of paper that says who the owner is. And so each framed object on the wall shows the history of the collecting of this painting. And so it went from being this object in the artist's studio to something that was now in a bank vault whose price had increased dramatically from something that had no price associated with it when it was first produced as simply a sketch to something that was worth in excess of a million dollars by 1975. This is the sketch that we're looking at, right? Is that this sketch? Actually, this looks like a painting. This is, well, yeah. The sketch itself is actually a painting. It's the small version in full color of the painting itself. Oh, okay. So when you're saying sketch, it's just kind of a small... Exactly. It's a model for the large scale. And this was done by Seurat. Exactly. And Haka, he, he took, he actually, in his, his piece of art, uh, or I guess installation, whatever we call it, he took the original piece of art? No, he didn't or he, actually. Or he just photocopied? And he didn't even but have. But it was a, literally a photocopy. Well, he didn't have access to the original because the original right. was now in a bank vault. And I right. think that was part of his issue that right. now this was something that was out of circulation. Like that it, it had become a, an investment as right. opposed to a work of art that existed in the world. And uh, this is interesting. I mean, this is something that. I guess it is. Uh, I keep. Str I struggle a little bit because, at minimum, I'm willing to say that this is definitely interesting. Like, I think it's interesting to just even have that. I mean, it feels like something we would do at Khan Academy in terms of just look at this piece of art and look at how who's owned it. Isn't this something to think about? And It's almost a grasp of its, its financial value. It, right? it, it, exactly. And, and, and the reason why, going back to the, the art, not art, or traditional notions of art and modern notions of art, and this is definitely a very modern notion of art. It's, it's not a, uh, you know, 500 years ago. In fact, the original work of art is absent. Yes. What I actually really like about it, and I feel is to some degree almost more consistent than a lot of what we've looked at, is that he did not feel the need to do it on oil and canvas. That he felt that, look, that's not a... I, I do like the fact that he just said, well, look, if we're just going to go really pushing the envelope, why am I stuck to this, you know, mixing paint and, and all the rest? That general idea is actually a very good idea. And you almost hope that, like, you could have a whole museum of that, of, of people documenting what these pieces of artwork are, where they've been, all these, all these things that are no longer accessible to the public. And where are they? What's their history? I think that'd be a fascinating thing. But also, it really documents the way the object's meaning has changed. So it's not just the financial value that's at issue, but it's also the way in which it began as something that was intimate and that was really a stepping stone towards another major finished painting, and then becomes almost a, a simple monetary instrument. So is something gained, is something lost? It goes from being something personal to the artist to being a commodity. I mean, that's what everyone to some degree cares about. That's their fascination. What is this worth? What is someone willing to pay for it? What's the and, and I'm I'm kind of conflicted because I've asked those same questions when I've seen I've asked y'all that same those same questions. Sure. What is this worth? Or what are you know what what's the history of it? And I really like the idea of what Hakka did. It's both a little sad. It is taking art and a lot of this art is this very personal thing and it, I mean it's really just pointing out irony or hypocrisy or something. But at the same time I actually think it's it's almost really healthy and maybe every piece of artwork should have that where you see it. You actually see where it's been. And it's interesting that it's an artist doing it as opposed to an institution. Right. It's not a museum that, or a curatorial perspective, but it's actually seen as the more subjective, radical positioning of an artist. Yeah, and that's interesting because, I mean, it's, I mean because it's a one-off piece, it looks like a, or it's, and I know this was his intention, is this work of art, but yeah. it, it does fall into kind of you know curation and and a really good curation idea for me it says well it's just a an interesting curation idea or provocative idea can that be considered art 
And in fact, there's an entire movement that developed from the 1960s through the 70s and 80s up to the present, which is known as institutional critique, where artists have used art to point out some of the politically more sensitive issues that surround the exhibition of art. And so there is this interesting antagonistic relationship that can exist. I mean, I, I mean, this is really art as a tool for social commentary. Which I guess is what it always was. I, I think that's <laughs> I, right. I said that as a statement initially saying, oh, this is so different than, you know, but I was like, well, maybe not. A lot of the discussion that we've had talks about the complex relationship between the market, between institutions, and between art and artists. And so this kind of institutional critique really puts a spotlight on that. But it doesn't seem to be a good strategy overall. I mean, I actually really appreciate it as, as a that he's doing that and it, it's very honest and, and, and not hypocritical. What does it mean f even when the market has absorbed the avant-garde to try to remain outside? But what do you think has been the le so, so what do you think the lesson has been learned from the art market? Well now artists are specifically invited to museums to do a kind of institutional critique. Oh really? Yeah, <laughs> because now we actually know that there's real value. There's market value in it and there's other kinds of value in it and so there's a kind of inviting of artists into the space of a museum to do that kind of Well, that of kind critique. of cheapens it in a strange way. And, and, and so how do the benefactors or the sponsors view this? That's a really interesting question. I'm not sure that all corporate entities are open to that, but I think that the ones that are take a, a kind of enlightened position that actually I think is seen in a very positive way. Mm -hmm.